Good evening and thank you very much for coming to this event. To acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which the campuses of Macquarie University are situated, I would like to invite my good friend and senior Darug man, Lexodius Dad, to perform the welcome to country. Lex? Bujari Ingini, ladies and gentlemen. That's good evening in Darug language. Uh, we stand on today upon the Wadamadigal um, clan, clan or country. It's, it's part of the Darug nation. It's protocol for me to start off the proceedings with, I pay respects to my elders, both past and present, and I honour my ancestors. I'm from the Wamali clan, just over in Prospect, and there's no people really left from the Wadamadigal clan anymore, so I get the privilege to come over here and welcome you to country. Now, a lot of people ask me, what's a welcome to country? So I explain it to people. Traditionally, um, Australia is made up of over 300 different countries and over 300 different languages and dialects. Aboriginal people didn't have the right to go into other people's countries without permission. You would go and sit on their borders, light a fire and send some smoke up, then wait to be approached by a traditional custodian. They would then come and ask of your business, whether you were there to meet for ceremony, to uh, spread important news, etc. And normally a celebration would follow from that, a corroboree, a dance and a much bigger part of a welcome than I'm doing tonight. So that is the welcome to country and I thank Macquarie University because it carries on a tradition for us and to know that Aboriginal people are still alive and well and practicing their culture here in Australia. Now also I explain it to people too, my people in Sydney were the first contacted by the English and with Aboriginal people we have a certain gene in our body and I explain this to people because they look at me and they go, he's not Aboriginal, he's a white fellow, how come he's not black? And when Aboriginal people mix with other races and other nationalities, we take on their features within two generations. So my people were first contacted by the English and I actually have mixed heritage over Irish and Aboriginal blood. But I'd like to quickly just share a little story with you. I'm, a lot of people know here that I was a chef for many years and I remember going through cooking college and leaving the south coast to New South Wales and going down to Melbourne as a young 19 year old man and I thought all food was French and I went and worked at a hotel and it was owned by Greek people. And we served all the traditional Australian food on the menu, but what I found, and they opened my eyes up, there was an illegal gambling house out the back. <laughs> and it was all the old Greek men. And they had all these big stern faces and I used to have to go out, stay later after work and go and feed them. And they taught me how to make a beautiful thing, which I still cook today, a mezze and it was wonderful. And I could tell if they were doing well because they'd always tip me. <laughs> and one of them showed me a recipe once, I think, I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, Leonard, is spenacopita. But I could never make it like their nanas, or I could never like their mums, but they liked my messes. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to Darug Land, Watami, Didgerigore, thank you. Well, on behalf of the uh, Faculty of Arts and Macquarie University Art Gallery, I'd like, you to wel like to welcome you all to the opening of the exhibition Selling an American Dream, America's, uh, Australia's Greek Cafe. I'd also like particularly to welcome the Honourable George Suris, Minister for the Arts, and, and the Greek Consul General, Mr. Vasileos Tolios, and Mrs. Tolios, to this opening. Okiria, Okiria. Kalos Elthete, Star Panestimonial Mass, Star Gallery Mass, Star Cafeneone Mass, the Heristo Pili. And um, I'm Professor John Simons, um, the uh, Dean of the Faculty of Arts at Macquarie University, and I always take the opportunity of these uh, gallery openings to say a few words about the great work we do here. At Macquarie, we have a commitment to teaching modern Greek language and modern Greek culture, which goes back over 30 years. Our Greek Student Association is now 29 years old. Our commitment to teaching ancient Greek and Byzantine Greek culture goes back even further. The university this year is 49 years old, and to the best of my knowledge, our Greek department is also 49 years old. So Greek studies and Macquarie University have walked together since uh, the beginning of this university. And I'd like also to take the opportunity to thank uh, the Greek government and people through Mr. Tolios for the generous help they give us in maintaining our extensive programs in modern Greek. 
This photographic exhibition showcases the Greek-run cafes that populated Australian country towns and cities, merging local fare with new American food catering ideas. And they made a tremendous impact on the changes to Australian eating habits, changes that we still enjoy today, I would suggest. Research undertaken throughout Australia and internationally have highlighted these cafes as a kind of Trojan horse for the Americanization of, American popul of Australian popular culture, not only affecting eating habits, but also cinema, music, and architecture. And this exhibition has been curated by historian Leonard Januszewski and documentary photographer Effie Alexakis. They have both been researching the historical and contemporary Greek-Australian presence both within Australia and overseas since 1982. So this is a project which has been a long time in the making. Their ongoing project, in their own image, Greek Australians is recognised as one of the largest collections of Greek Australian material in the country. The archive encompasses a wealth of visual images, re recorded interviews, paper-based textual documents and memorabilia. It's currently housed at Macquarie University in partnership with the Australian History Museum and the Discipline of Modern History at Macquarie. And in 2001, Leonard Janiszewski was awarded the New South Wales History Fellowship to research the Greek cafe. Both Leonard and Effie have served on history or arts advisory boards. And I'd like also to stress that this exhibition is part of the 2013 Greek Festival of Sydney, an initiative of the Greek Orthodox community of New South Wales. And I would like to invite the director of the Greek Festival of Sydney, Nia Kateris, to say a few words. Please welcome Nia Kateris. Thank you, Professor Simmons. Um, the Honourable Vasilios Stolios, Consul General of Greece in Sydney, Mrs. Theodora Tolios, the Honourable George Suras, Minister of the Arts, Professor John Simmons, Lex Marinos, my friend, Leonard and Effie, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. The Greek Festival of Sydney is extremely proud that, to have this exhibition as part of this year's Greek Festival. We've also been very proud to be part of the exhibition in 2004 in her own image. Now in its 31st year, the festival has played a key role in providing a forum for showcasing multitude, multitude of Greek and, multi, uh, Greek and multicultural expressions by featuring the finest Greek Australian talent. Our two month cultural program enables us to explore the beauty of Greek culture and celebrate the vibrant multiculturalism of Sydney. The dedication of Effie and Leonard um, to this project and beyond since 1982 should be applauded. As the Greek Australian, very honoured to be proud and that due to this commitment, the, it will ensure that the Greek Australian heritage will remain for many generations to come. Great mobile. <laughs> Effie and Leonard also have another event as part of this year's Greek festival and that's on the 17th of April at the Greek community and it's in the festival program and it's remembering Australian Greek cafes. It's going to be an open forum and we invite everybody to come along and also the guests that can come and, and share the memorabilia memories of their cafes. On behalf of the Greek Orthodox community and the Greek festival, thank you for being part of this program this year. We wish you every success in the future. Officially to open this exhibition, I'd now like to invite actor, director, broadcaster, writer and arts administrator Lex Marinos. Lex was born in Wagga Wagga in country New South Wales, where his family ran the Bridge Cafe. During his illustrious career, he has worked in all areas of the entertainment industry as an actor, director, a writer, a radio commentator, a producer, and a festival director. A regular on television, his best known television drama and comedy productions have included Ringswood, Kingswood County, The Slap, Scoop, Live and Sweaty, Bulls Up, Good News Week, and World Series Debating. In theatre, he's appeared with the Nimrod APG Sydney Theatre, Melbourne Theatre Company, Beaver, as well as in various commercial productions, including the hugely successful King and I. As director, he's worked in all mediums, including the films An Indecent Obsession and Remember Me, and television series such as Bodyline, Embassy, A Country Practice, and several documentaries. In 1994, Lex was awarded OAM for his services to the performing arts, and in 2001, he was awarded a Centenary of, Centenary of Federation Medal. Please welcome Lex Marinos. Mr. General Tolios and Mr. Tolios, uh, Minister Suris, uh, Nia, lovely to see you after many years. 
fantastic. I can't believe you're still doing the Greek festival. It's, for 10 years, my goodness. That would have been a difficult gig. Um, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, well, it's sort of... Uh, I feel as though Leonard's already wrung out of me everything he could possibly get about growing up in a cafe. And I, I'm at a loss really to know what to add to what I've already uh, discussed with Leonard. Uh, I'd like to begin by also acknowledging um, uh, the traditional custodians of the land on which we're holding this ceremony, uh, their ancestors, past and present, and in fact our ancestors, past and present, many of whom are, um, are on the walls here. And, uh, and I suppose it's when you are overwhelmed by the wealth of material that Leonard and Effie have collected over, over the years, you get a really strong sense of of how rich this heritage is and how, uh, what an extraordinary contribution that, uh, that it's made to Australian culture. I mean, and I say that literally, I remember this man here, Mr. Namarcus. This is in the, um, in the, uh, the, the Capitol Theatre in Wagga. There were two, we had two, in those days, uh, growing up in the 50s and 60s, Wagga was about 25,000 people and there was an, a network of Greek cafes. And both the Capitol Theatre and the Plaza Theatre, the two, cinema, uh, two cinemas, both had cafes run by Greeks. And I remember Mr. Marcus and his family very well. And this gentleman on the corner there, whose name I've forgetten, forgotten, he features in several photos in, uh, that I have of, uh, of my family from that time. And it's, I come in, I see those familiar faces, and they automatically transport me back to my childhood, which, um, which is my earliest memory of the cafe. Uh, we lived above the cafe, so certainly for the first several years of my life, the cafe was my entire world. I assumed everybody lived in a cafe. Um, but it didn't occur to me that you'd live anywhere else. Uh, I, there's, without wishing to be controversial and, and ruining the whole um, curation of this, uh, of this exhibition, uh, a few months ago I was uh, on a TV assignment for SBS on uh, Who Do You Think You Are, which, you know, it's a genealogy program and traces back one's forebears, and um, I assumed that they, that they knew all of my Greek background, my Greek heritage, and, and that I certainly felt as though I knew all of that and, uh, and didn't really need to know any more. But, but they did find with my grandmother, uh, who was born here in Australia from what I thought was a Scottish family. In fact, it goes back further than that, an Anglo-Scottish family. Um, and she had married my grandfather who'd come from Cassos. And in those days it was not, you know, this is the 19, late after World War I, uh, in the 1920s. Greeks were not fantastically popular within the, the community in that stage. Um, uh, and it, that would have been very bold on her behalf and very courageous on her behalf to enter into, into such a union. And um, they had their first cafe in a, in a place called Bogengate in... Um, <laughs> now, listen. <laughs> Bogen, I'll have you know, was a very distinguished indigenous warrior. That's the term bogan, that's where it comes from. I also, like you, thought I would make some very cheap stereotypical jokes and turn up in a flanny and some Ugg boots and maybe a beanie and it would have been totally inappropriate. Um, so I didn't do it. Uh, that didn't stop Leonard and I from making those jokes off camera. Um, <clears throat> but I'm happy to say they're not in the final cut. Uh, so someone exercised some good taste somewhere along the line, which clearly Leonard and I were incapable of doing. Um, anyway, they had their first cafe there, and uh, due to circumstances, uh, which I don't fully understand, and uh, I wasn't even born at the time, so I, I'm hardly prepared to take responsibility for it, but there was a certain amount of bankruptcy went on. Um, and in order to, and my grandfather set about working his way out of this, I have to say, and, and very admirably so, but when, the, when, when they came to buy the cafe in Wagga, uh, it was actually bought by my grandmother. She was, so legally, it's more, an, legally, 
it's a sort of Anglo-Scottish-Australian cafe, <laughs> legally. Culturally, it was Greek. There was no question. Uh, it was Greek, it was where Greek was spoken, Greek was, uh, customs were observed, Greek food we ate. We didn't necessarily serve that to, uh, to the customers because they, in those days, weren't necessarily looking for it. Um, they were happy with fish and chips and a steak and eggs and um, it really lash out and get a mixed grill. Uh, and it's amazing to realise how much protein we ate in those, <laughs> in those days. The cholesterol in those days must have been phenomenal. Could have powered the country on it. Um, but I do, remember the, uh, I do remember the cafe very vividly and I've been back to, uh, I've been back to Wagga several, you know, over the years, 50 years ago since we left, since I left there, I think, yeah. And, um, and I've been back many times in the meantime and the cafe is still there. I'm happy to say it's changed hands several times, which is uh, as it, things should be. It's now called um, Scribbles. And um, <laughs> it's a little bit stuck in the 80s, I think. In the, you know, when you, you, know, you get butcher paper, when you sit down at the table and you can, you know, and crayons on the table and you can write and that sort of stuff. None of that nowadays. Um, it's... Uh, and it's even when I go there now, it's still dominated by the ghosts of my... Who, no matter who the proprietor is, I still imagine my grandfather ruling the roost there and uh, my mother and her sisters serving behind the counter and on the tables and Dad and uh, a couple of the young Greek guys out the back in the kitchen working there, which is... And I preferred being in the kitchen. I, uh, I loved growing up in the cafe because it was very... Obviously because, you know, you could steal lollies and... Oh, you didn't even have to steal them. I was given them for free. Um, and I used them to try and win curry favour with my friends at school. Uh, and when that didn't work, I used cigarettes, which I could also <laughs> steal. Um, and, uh, and stole many of them. Um, I, I'm not ashamed to admit. The memories I really have of the, of the cafe were, were that it was... It, did, it was more than just a metaphor for life. It actually was life. It's where I had the opportunity to experience the outside world coming in and, and alternatively, uh, as certain progressions through my own uh, growing up, you know, the expanding ripples that took me out of the cafe into, the, into school, into the real world into, and eventually away from Wagga altogether and, and into the wide world. Um, but, I, uh, but clearly, you know, I'm shaped by those events and... Uh, and the two events that I, I can remember, which I haven't told Leonard about uh, previously, because I was too embarrassed. Um, the first one, I remember being out the back in the kitchen. And I would have been very young, and in fact, it's one of my earliest memories of all time. And uh, for some reason, that we were all congregated in the, in the kitchen, or my memory tells me that we were all congregated in the kitchen. And I was sitting down the end of a, the very big long table where they did all the food preparation with a glass of lemonade. And for some reason, inspired, in retrospect, I see, uh, for some reason I picked up the glass of lemonade and poured it over my head. <laughs> it was the first time, not the last time, that I poured a drink over my head, but um, that was the first time and I realised it made people laugh. It made, and it made me feel good. A little bit sticky, but good. Uh, at good making people laugh. I thought, this is, great, this is a great thing to do. And so, metaphorically, I've spent, you know, a whole career of the last 40 years pouring glasses of lemonade over my head and people pay me to do it, which is an extraordinary thing. The other thing I remember at the cafe uh, that I haven't told Leonard previously is that um, it was the site of a very, very early terrorist plot. Um, in the early 1950s, there was a change of... Uh, and it coincided more or less with when I started going to school. There was a change of um, monarch in England and Elizabeth II came to the throne. And as part of her coronation tour, she came to Australia and did a, a car trip around you know, the areas, including coming through the Riverina and, uh, and going through Wagga. And um, I don't know what possessed me, but I think it was... Um, I think it had something to do with going to school and having to sing God Save Our Queen. And I, I just, I mean, I didn't, I didn't necessarily mind singing it, but I just knew that it didn't have anything to do with me, in, in a sense. You know, I, we had a different sort of national anthem, and that just seemed one that I just... I mean, I didn't mind getting the polio vaccinations and things like that, but, <laughs> but the national anthem, I didn't really, you know... Anyway, uh, somewhere in my brain... <laughs> 
very loose term, uh, somewhere in my brain, I think there was an early Republican fervour was stirred and, um, and we had a big barrel of, of frozen peas, or, you know, hard peas that you had to put in water to boil them up to soften them. And I armed myself with half a dozen of these and a little bamboo pea, pea shooter. And I made my way up while everyone was lying down in Fitzmaurice Street and Baylor Street in Wagga to see the, the motorcade go through. And I snuck upstairs to my parents' um, uh, bedroom where you had a very good look down into the street. Uh, think of it as a grassy knoll. Um, <laughs> and armed with my bamboo pea shooter and a few hard peas, as the cavalcade went by, <coughs> <coughs> I don't know what happened to the peas. I don't, there was no report in the paper of the Queen <laughs> being hit by a random pea flying through the air, and I hurried, scurried back down to mingle with the crowd so that, so that there'd be no suspicion. Um, but that's, you know, there too, a couple of memories I, I remember of the cafe. So it was all of those things for me. It was a terrorist outpost, it was, uh, it was a place of entertainment, um, and most of all, it was a place of sanctuary. And, uh, and I, I, I suppose all that any child could hope for and, um, and all that you could hope for for your own children and grandchildren, of which we have one more today. Um, yeah, I know. Um, um, is that they have the opportunity to grow up in a, in a very nurturing, loving, safe environment. And that's what the cafe certainly was for me. And for that, uh, I'm eternally grateful. And the fact that was in Wagga in those days, as I say, there was a whole network of them. It was like a huge uh, collection of islands in a sea of Englishness. And, um, and it, that was an advantage and a disadvantage. Obviously, the strength of the, the community was, was one very memorable thing. And as I mentioned earlier, in that sense of ever-expanding uh, ripples that uh, that lead outwards the whole Riverina. There was there was a network of cafes, Greek cafes throughout the Riverina, throughout New South Wales, throughout the rest of the Austra uh, Australia, to the places overseas where we had friends and cousins and relatives, and that network was very protective, and um, which was which was great. So it meant we could go anywhere. And as I say, both the cinemas uh, in Wagga at that stage had Greek uh, milk bars, Greek cafes, confectionery shops in them. Um, it also meant we couldn't muck up because the network was very strong and if any was got out of line that would very quickly get relayed around the, the cafes and we'd be told to stop behaving like Turks. <laughs> very controversial. I didn't realise at the time it was so controversial. Um, so it was a, a, a great place of sanctuary, it was a great place to, to grow up and uh, in conclusion I'd, I'd also like to to really acknowledge the work of Leonard and Effie, who, um, who have you know, like been obsessively pursuing this for 30-something years now. Uh, it's the most extraordinary archive, and my compliments to, to the university for housing this archive. It's an incredibly valuable resource. And I don't just say that about the Greek-Australian community. It tells us so much about Australia in the sense that we are a conglomeration of similar types of communities that have come here for many similar reasons and to see them built up and I don't know of any other community that is as well documented as the Greek Australian community thanks to Leonard and Effie and I think that's a, just an extraordinary effort. Um, and, I, and it hasn't been easy as they, you know I, I know from being friends with them for that long it hasn't been an easy road uh, or path to take but they've doggedly pursued it um, when many more sane people would have given up such an exploit and I'm really grateful that they have that. So if it means that there needs a formal opening of this exhibition and if I'm the one to do it, then I'd like to uh, announce this exhibition open. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm one. Oh, thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, Lex. Um, we're nearly there. I have a few thanks uh, to make. Um, firstly, people who often get forgotten, uh, Leonard and uh, Effie are, have put this on, but also in the gallery, uh, Leonard and Rhonda are tireless in their delivery of first-class exhibitions. 
and I know that many of you come here very regularly and you see their work. And I'd also just like to thank uh, Aditi Uheya, uh, the uh, events manager of the faculty, who also uh, turns these events out pretty seamlessly. Um, I've got particular thanks also to give to the following, who are our, uh, and this is important, our, our principal sponsors and support for the exhibition's development. The Nicholas Aroni Trust, the New South Wales Minister of the Arts, the Australasian Hellenic Education Progressive Association, the Macquarie University Staff Award Scheme. And thank you also to Richard Milne for providing much of the cafe wear on display. So I hope you'll all enjoy the exhibition. It'll run at the gallery here until the 1st of May and will be open on every Saturday in April. Please look at the gallery's websites for other Saturdays and other events, and there will be quite a few other events associated with this exhibition. Thank, thank you very much for coming, and I wish you a safe journey home. Thank you very much.